a little Presbyterian prehistory before we can really tell the story of First Press, and it goes back to a couple of characters we've already talked about, so just to very briefly remind you, the two that I have in mind are Chief Gary, who was not a Presbyterian, he was an Anglican. He became a Presbyterian right after he died, I've got that on good authority, <laughs> but um, up until that moment he was Anglican, but his whole family was Presbyterian, and he was deeply affectionate to the Presbyterian Church, and the other, of course, is Henry Spaulding. And just to remind you, it was the four Nez Perce that triggered the response to what was deemed a Macedonian call that brought especially Presbyterian missionaries, Marcus and, uh, and Narcissa Whitman, Henry and Eliza Spaulding, missionaries who were Presbyterian. And they came and, of course, settled in the region of Walla Walla and Lapway. We've talked about that story before. There was also a Presbyterian presence here in Spokane. We've talked about Cushing Eels and Elkanah Walker, and although I've been slightly critical of them because they didn't fully appreciate Chief Gary as much as I wish they had, nevertheless, they had a very credible ministry here, and so it was Presbyterians. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, Catholic and Protestant, the most conspicuous Protestant presence in this region was clearly the Presbyterian presence in that time. Of course, the Whitman Massacre changed everything. The white presence here, the missionary presence, really had to evacuate for some years. It left Chief Gary once again the principal Christian leader in this entire region. He had sort of stepped back in the face of these who had greater expertise than he, but with the absence of the missionaries, he once again stepped up. But of course, then the next decade or so was a time of conflict of some violence. The Native uh, American wars that took place in the 1850s became part of the dominant theme. We've looked at all of that. Things settled down in the 1860s. Gary once again was more or less taking on the role of a teacher and a preacher. The white presence had not really begun to develop at that point. But beginning in about the early 1870s, we begin to see the first handful of white settlers arriving in this region in the region of the Spokane Falls. So the early 1870s, among them, was a fellow by the name of J.M. Glover, who arrived here in 1873 and established a trading post, essentially, in which he was primarily interested in trade with the native popula population. Uh, J.M. Glover is sometimes called the father of Spokane. Some of you may know that. Chief Gary was aware of that a kind of trickle of white folks, settlers that were coming in. He was also concerned about the malaise that seemed to be falling over his own native population. And he wanted to kind of reinvigorate them a little bit. And so, as we mentioned earlier, he sent an appeal to Henry Spaulding, who was once again back in the region of Lapway. He had returned some years earlier, was now a more elderly man and asked Spaulding if he would come, a Presbyterian would come and preach in this region and see if we could kind of reinfuse some sort of greater spiritual focus, especially among the native folks who lived in this region. And in 1873, Henry Spaulding did that to great effect, and literally hundreds of the Spokane tribe and others in this region were baptized by Henry Spaulding. Of course, Chief Gary never baptized anyone. He was not ordained and he fully respected that particular limit. So this was a time when many people confessed their faith and were baptized. Gary always hoped that an Anglican would come to town. And in fact, he sent letters occasionally to the Anglican church seeking from them that they would send a missionary or pastor to this region. Those requests more or less were ignored. And so Gary was always willing to kind of work with the Presbyterians. He always hoped he would get an Anglican presence. It never really happened. The following year in 1874, he once again sent to uh, Henry Spaulding, <coughs> excuse me, and asked if Henry would once again come and preach. But at this time, Henry uh, declined, mainly because he was suffering some health problems at the moment. He wrote a very endearing letter. If I had a little more time, I'd like to read Henry's letter to Spokane Gary, but I'll have to save that for some other occasion. But in any event, uh, Henry actually asked Gary if he would come to Lapway and participate in a camp meeting. 
that uh, Henry was going to be running, and Gary did so with some of the Spokane tribe coming along with him. Well, as it turns out, Spalding's health did not improve, and in fact, later that year, 1874, he died. He sent in his stead a young missionary who had just arrived in the region and had been working in the Lapway area for some time, another Presbyterian, whose name was H.T. Cowley. And so instead of Spalding, we have Mr. Cowley now who comes to the Spokane area and begins to labor as a Presbyterian in this region, really at the request of Spokane Gary, even though uh, Spokane Gary had actually been hoping to have Spalding come. Cowley arrived and he was a Presbyterian, and I have to say in all honesty, again, he was not quite as appreciative, I don't think, of Gary as he should have been. I don't think he was as appreciative as Spalding would have been, but they were not hostile to each other. They had a cordial relationship, but again, I think Cowley sort of missed an opportunity here. The only biography I know of of, uh, of Cowley is written by Clifford Drury. It's still available. It's called A Teepee in His Front Yard. And it's an interesting story of Cowley. Of course, you know the name Cowley if you've lived in Spokane any length of time. And so it tells in some detail the relationship that Cowley had with Gary and his own Presbyterian ministry in this region. Cowley was a missionary on behalf of the Presbyterian Church. He also had another capacity. He was actually in a governmental, sort of bureaucratic uh, status as an Indian sub-agent. And so he had both of those roles that he played for several years. When he first arrived in this region, he was conflicted as to where to establish his home and really the place of his missionary operations. There were about six different venues that were appropriate and possible, but he finally landed on some land that was offered to him by a Spokane chief whose name was Chief Enoch. He was also a Christian, and that was a Christian name that had been given to him. And so Cowley established his presence here on land given by Enoch in the fall of 1874. He immediately started daily services, morning and evening teaching and preaching services. And in fact, in that fall of 84, he was actually visited by the Presbyterian Cushing Eels that we mentioned earlier. Eels was delighted to see that there was a renewal of Presbyterian ministry in this region, and Eels took full credit for all of the things that he had done in advance to lay the groundwork for this ministry. So uh, anyway, these two uh, had kind of a nice mutual admiration experience there. But um, many were attending the services that were held by Cowley, including Gary. He was perfectly happy to come. He was always a modest man. He never exaggerated his own knowledge or his own uh, abilities. He always kind of, you know, because he was the only thing around, would step up and be the minister. But as soon as someone else came with greater expertise, he was willing to back away. And he just attended these services and brought his entire family and was very cordially appreciative of the ministry of Cowley. It was Gary and some other Spokans who actually sponsored a great Thanksgiving celebration the fall of 1874. It must have looked a little bit like the original Thanksgiving because the food was prepared by the natives. It was native delicacies. They had no turkey, but they did have uh, you know, food. They had uh, uh, fish. They had uh, camas roots, you know, and other delicacies and so on. I'm sure it was quite a wonderful celebration. School opened, uh, taught by and run by H.T. Cowley in the spring of 1875. And so this became an educational opportunity for the Spokane natives, especially who were here. And at that point, as I said, Gary more or less gave up his preaching and teaching capacity, which essentially he'd been doing now for another 10 years or so prior to this time. He was appreciative of the school. He had four foster, or three foster boys that he was caring for, and Gary put them in the care of H.T. Cowley at this point, reflecting his own confidence in the labors that were being conducted there. As I say, Gary's entire family, his wife Nina, his daughter Nellie, his extended family, all became Presbyterian, and they all became Presbyterian largely from the influence of H.T. Cowley. And as I say, Gary and Cowley had a very warm and friendly relationship, but they had a little bit of a difference uh, that developed later. In 1876, 
Cowley spoke to the white settlers who were here and quite a goodly number of natives who came as well in a centennial celebration. This was the 100 year anniversary, of course, of the United States. And so he gave quite a, quite a stirring speech at that point, celebrating the United States and what it had achieved. But he also introduced at that time something that certainly was a bit jarring to Spokane Gary. And it really began to be a bit of the rift that developed between them, but that became somewhat severe over a later time. And that was simply that he encouraged the Spokans in this region to despair, to give up the idea of hanging on to any kind of reservation along the Spokane River. As you know, Gary had been deeply concerned about that. That had been one of his principal objectives. And to hear now a man with sort of official responsibility and authority, the Indian sub-agent in this region, you know, discouraging Gary from those hopes and objectives was at least to him somewhat disturbing. Things became even more interesting the following year. Last week, if you were here, we talked about the Nez Perce Wars that broke out in 1877. We talked a little bit about the tangential involvement of George Whitworth in that particular incident. Well, this was the time when that took place, and that provoked a bit of a alarm here in Spokane. There was a Methodist mass, uh, a minister who arrived whose name was S.J. Havermail. May be a familiar name to some of you. He brought word, the first word that we had in this area, of the Nez Perce War. And those 50 to 60 white settlers panicked because they thought this was going to spread like wildfire. The Spokans would probably join in and we are all dead meat. That was kind of the way they viewed it. And so they fled in a panic to ha what came to be called Havermail Island. And they holed up there in a kind of fortress mentality uh, fearing that it was only a matter of time and they were going to be uh, you know, looking at the wrong end of a tomahawk. And they were so delighted to see Spokane Gary come riding up along the shore on the bank looking across the, the water there to Havermail Island on his, on his horse looking very chiefly and he raised his hand in a signal of peace. And he uh, signaled that he wanted them to send over some representatives to have a conversation with him. So three or four brave white representatives went over to talk to Gary, who was still kind of viewed as the major leader of the Indians in that region. And Gary sat down, looked them in the eye, and in the native dialect said something comparable to chill out. <laughs> he said, come on guys. You know, I'm a Christian, we're Christians. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna participate in the Nez Perce War, and we're certainly not going to put your lives at risk. You guys need to relax. And so that was essentially what Gary said. They were so relieved to hear that, and they began tentatively returning to their homes. It was only about three or four days later that some Nez Perce warriors arrived, hoping to incite among the Spokans sympathy for and participation in the Nez Perce War, and Gary again was the one who went and said to them, you guys are barking up the wrong tree, and sent them on their way. So there was no meaningful participation whatsoever in this region in that Nez Perce conflict. In the same year, 1877, the Lower Spokans actually signed a treaty, as you know, that created what's called the Spokane Indian Reservation. The upper and middle, who Gary represented, were still holding out for a reservation along the Spokane River. We've talked about this before, so they continued to uh, hold out for that. An interesting thing happened in 1879. H.T. Uh, Cowley had been here now for some years, and there was a growing population of white settlers. It wasn't growing highly rapidly, but certainly a significant number were coming in every year, and a fair number of these were congregational. I would say the two major Protestant denominations in this area at the time were the Presbyterians and the Congregationals. And the Congregationals wanted a church. Cowley was a Presbyterian pastor, and they actually organized a church in 1879 and asked Cowley if he would come and be, in a sense, their interim pastor providing pastoral care for them on an interim basis. So though a Presbyterian, he agreed, and he became the pastor of what was called First Congregational Church in 1879. 
the ministry actually flourished. And by about three years later, Cowley actually resigned his status as a Presbyterian pastor. He joined the congregational denomination. He also resigned his status as an Indian sub-agent. And so at this point, 1882, you have a bit of a crisis for the Presbyterians in town. There's a fair number of white Presbyterians, and not to mention all the native of folks who were Presbyterian, because now they had lost their Presbyterian leadership. H.T. Cowley is sort of bolted uh, to the congregational side. And so as a result of that, these folks, 13 in particular, sent a letter to the Synod that was covering this entire region asking if a replacement could be sent here to take the place of H.T. Cowley. And in response, the church, the, the, the uh, fellow that was running the Synod actually, uh, contacted and sent a fellow whose name was Thomas G. Watson. Thomas G. Watson is the founder of First Presbyterian Church, Spokane. So there he is. He's, an, he's a handsome guy, don't you think? Look at that. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. He's a lot smarter than me. I'm going to say that, though. Anyway, Thomas G. Watson was the man. He was born in New York, 1836. He was raised Presbyterian. He went to Hobart College, graduated from a Dutch Reformed seminary in 1860. He was uh, a home missionary, which means he was a missionary, but of course he didn't go to a foreign land. There was a lot of mission work to do even domestically, and so he was involved in that for 10 years after graduating from seminary. And then he took a position as a pastor at Waukesha, Wisconsin. This was in 1871, and he was there until 1882. While there, he married a woman by the name of Jane E. Bean. Now, she was a widow, and she had a son from her prior marriage whose name was Walker Bean. And some of you may recognize that because that's a fairly well-known name in the history of Spokane. And in fact, her son, uh, uh, Mr. Watson's stepson, Walker Bean, became a very prominent businessman in Spokane eventually in the early days of Spokane. Well, what happened was our 13 Presbyterian forebears way back there in the late 1800s had requested a pastor, the missionary of what was called the West Coast Synod in this region was a man by the name of R.B. Hill. I think it was Robert Hill. And he was aware of Thomas Watson and his experience as a home missionary years earlier. And so the two of them got together and Hill actually proposed to Watson that he might want to take a look at the prospects of becoming once again a home missionary in this region of Spokane in the Spokane Falls area. They almost immediately got into a dispute when they looked at a map of this region because Hill thought all of the action is in a little town that is developing that is named for the railroad tycoon whose name was Benjamin Cheney. And so Hill thought that's where you want to put the church. That's going to be the center of action. It's probably going to be the county seat. And so you want to put a church there. Watson, on the other hand, looked at the map and said, looks to me like everything's happening down there by the river, you know, and there's a lot more natives there. So, so they kind of agreed to disagree for a while. But in any event, they arrived in this area in 1883 in the month of May. And so it was at that time that uh, we have the first really uh, establishment of this Presbyterian church. Spokane Falls by that time now had grown to a village uh, in terms of the white population of about 1,500. As I say, there had been gradual growth over the last several years. The whites were actually increasing rapidly, partly because the railroad through this area was completed in the same year, 1883. And just to give you a feel for it, uh, the growth of the area had grown to about 20,000 by the year 1890. So it's a kind of a rapid uh, growing trajectory. Well, the organizational meeting for First Presbyterian Church actually took place at First Congregational Church. The 13 Presbyterians met with Mr. Watson and in a sense conducted the official business to create this church. And so it took place about that time in 1883. Watson was a missionary. 
And so even though he was the functional pastor of the church, he also was a church planter. He planted a Presbyterian church in Spangle, in Rockford, in Davenport, in Rathdrum, and in Coeur d'Alene. First Presbyterian, our forebears, we bounced from pillar to post for about the first three years. There was exploding population in Spokane, as I've just indicated to you. And to make matters a little more interesting, there was gold that was discovered, as some of you know, in the Coeur d'Alene area about the same time. And so, as I say, there was about 20,000 people here by some eight or seven, nine years after the beginnings of First Press. And that had an effect on available real estate. And so we were kind of being uh, bounced around from here to there. Rising demand for office space and so on was creating something of turmoil. So about six times over a three-year period, we moved around. Our first home was called the Cannon Building. A.M. Cannon was a trustee of First Presbyterian Church, and he offered a little office space upstairs in this office building that was here at the time. However, he, in the pressure of the rising population had to do some remodeling the following year and it forced the congregation to look for other quarters. Pastor Watson gave a sermon at that time from the text that says, quote, we have dwelt long enough in this height. And so on that they moved and they moved to Van Dorn's Opera House. In 1884, we moved from there to Glover Hall, 1884 to 85 through the winter back to Van Dorn's Opera House in 1885, and then to a skating rink from uh, 1885 into the fall. However, there was a universal conviction among the people, it's too cold in here, and so we left that place, and we actually had services in a storeroom through the winter of 1885 into 1886. Well, by that time, we had actually accumulated sufficient resources to lay the cornerstone for our first building, which was laid on August 16, 1886. Pastor Watson was present, gave the sermon. The building was completed in December, and I hope you can see that. That is our first church building. And so uh, you can almost see a little bit of a similarity, can't you? A much more modest expression of what First Presbyterian eventually became. Watson was very excited about this little building. His own description was as follows, quote, when completed and finished, this church edifice was a model of neatness and coziness, pronounced by all the prettiest church for the money uh, in this part of the country and at that time, by far the finest in Spokane Falls. Well, this church building was located where the Spokesman Review Building now stands. It served uh, members until about 1889. It was sold, if you can believe this, for the astronomical sum of $21,000, which was a whole lot of money, but that speaks to the way in which inflationary forces had been pushing up prices throughout this area. This church sat about 185 people. Well, from there, again, we were on the move. We went to the Falls City Opera House in 1889. Unfortunately, much of the records of the church from that era were lost in what's called the Great Spokane Fire. Some of you who know the history of this community know that 32 blocks were leveled by a fire on August 4th, 1889. We were forced to move again, this time to Concordia Hall, which was at 2nd and Madison. We were there through the winter of 1889 into 1890, at which time the second building that was erected by First Presbyterian Church was dedicated. This was in December 21st, 1890, located at 2nd and Jefferson Streets, and that is what that church looked like. Again, I hope you can kind of make out the detail of it there. The Spokesman Review wrote a very uh, celebratory article concerning this building, and I just want to read a little part of it just to give you the flavor. So here's the Spokesman Review's review of this building. Quote, the new building is neatly and handsomely furnished on the interior with wood grain to resemble mahogany, and the walls artistically frescoed in bright and warm colors. It is lighted by gas and electricity and is heated by two furnaces. The building contains a ladies' parlor, which is handsomely and comfortably furnished, containing, among other things, an elegant upright piano. The audience room, uh, neatly carpeted, and will contain 535 handsome opera chairs. 
the audience room will be lighted entirely from the ceiling by means of reflectors. A handsome pulpit and communion table with pulpit furniture to correspond, all in cherry, have been placed in their respective positions. So this was uh, quite an achievement and the whole community was uh, appreciative of it. Nevertheless, you know, when you're in church, you're in church, and there were tensions, and that's always been the case. Uh, if you're ever concerned about tensions in the, in the life of First Presbyterian, just keep in mind, we are in great company because it's been happening all through our history. And at this point, there was a uh, kind of a disaffected group in the church who objected when Thomas Watson was installed as the permanent pastor. Up until this time, he had been kind of the home missionary type, the internal politics is a little bit hard to triangulate from this distance. I don't think Watson was really the, the principal source of the complaint, but it kind of centered around him. And it put him through a little bit of grief and stress at the time. But anyway, this small group, quite a minority, were disaffected and they actually severed their ties with First Presbyterian Church and formed another church which was called Westminster Presbyterian Church not to be confused with Westminster Presbyterian Church. <laughs> so we'll tell more of that in a minute. Watson was otherwise, however, a very popular and very important character in the community of Spokane. I think it's safe to say he was known throughout the community and was highly respected, virtually universally admired in this town, not simply for his leadership in the church, but for his conspicuous leadership in the community. So he was well-remembered and well-loved, way beyond the bounds of simply the life at First Presbyterian Church. Attendance here by 1891 was hovering around 500 or so. Some of the certain sermon titles by uh, Mr. Watson I think are interesting. One was Job and His Afflictions. So I don't know if that was a commentary on his own experience at the time, but he had that one. Adam and the First Man was a sermon title. The one I would really like to hear was entitled The Antediluvian Giants. I've always wondered about those guys and I'm sure he gave the uh, right answer there. Bible Orthodoxy. This was a time when there was rising liberal pressures coming from Europe that were putting pressure on American Christianity to loosen up some of the traditional convictions and beliefs and Watson of course stood strongly in that traditional set of convictions and so this was a sermon that was defending a Bible orthodoxy, kind of classical traditional Christian understanding. Another one that was more or less addressed to the Catholic alternative to a, a soteriological view was entitled Salvation by Faith, meaning salvation by faith alone. These were all uh, sermons he preached, of course, and many, many others. There was a strong emphasis then as now on music. Uh, Watson was, along with many others at the time, pretty uh, enthusiastic about the temperance movement. Again, in the Pacific Northwest especially, the ravaging negative effects of the abuse of alcohol were pretty conspicuous at many different levels, and it wasn't uncommon for Christian leaders to be on the bandwagon for the temperance movement. We talked about that last week a bit with George Whitworth. He was also strong on the observance of the Sabbath, something that is probably less uh, emphasized these days in Christian culture. He was uh, very much respected, as I say, throughout the community. We also had a strong outreach uh, ministry at this point. Uh, Watson was uh, responsible largely for starting a church way out to the north of Spokane Falls called Centenary Presbyterian Church. It became known as Knox Presbyterian. Maybe you've heard of it. So he was responsible for establishing that. He also provided Sunday school services to the Spokane natives especially who were living at this community. He supported an Indian farm in Pendleton and a Chinese school in Portland. I say he, but I mean the church, of course. He was rallying this support and even a native missionary stationed there in the Philippines. It came as a bit of a shock and surprise to many people when just the following year in 1891, Thomas Watson announced his resignation. The reason he gave was that the pressures and the stresses that he'd been through in these last several years had really taken a toll on his health and he felt that he just needed to pull back a little bit and kind of regroup. In his farewell sermon, he gave the following touching comment in the context of the sermon, quote, 
I need not assure you of my deep love for all you, nor of my hearty appreciation of your faithful and generous esteem for your pastor. God knows there is great pain in severing this sacred connection, but there is great joy also in the reflection that I can leave a church which is in a spiritual condition full of promise, thoroughly united and harmonious. Only beloved fervently seek the Lord's guidance in finding a new pastor, that he may be for you, quote, a man after God's own heart, the Lord's choice and yours in the Lord. Watson actually left the area for a while. He went to Portland. He did kind of recuperate a bit. He took some time off. He then came back to this area and pastored a church that he and himself founded some years earlier, the Presbyterian Church in Coeur d'Alene. But after about three years, he retired from that, again suffering some ill health. And he actually died in the year 1900. The services for Thomas Watson were held here at First Presbyterian. The pastor at that time was a man by the name of William Gebony, and William Gebony preached the memorial sermon. The newspaper reported of the service because, of course, Watson was well known in town. The sermon topic or title was taken from 2 Samuel 3:38. "Quote: Know ye not that there is a great man fallen this day in Israel?" Gebony, in part, said these about Watson. "Quote." The life and character of the Reverend Thomas G. Watson have been such as to warrant more than a passing notice. There are a few things that should be said, not in the spirit of eulogy or laudation, but in the spirit of fairness and justice to a true and noble life. Few of us who are younger appreciate the sense of sorrow that has come to the older citizens of Spokane in the death of Mr. Watson. His close association with the life and growth of this city has caused the citizens of all classes and conditions to feel a deep sense of loss. The fact that he was the first to undertake a, in a permanent way Presbyterian work here and to organize not only in the city but in the surrounding country, churches that have grown steadily from the first, causes the Presbyterian people to feel a special sense of loss. So his uh, loss was of course felt throughout the town, especially by those who were here at First Presbyterian. Watson was replaced by a man whose name was Frank J. Mundy. Uh, Mundy was from New Jersey. Uh, he graduated from Rutgers and Princeton. He was a bright guy. He had had two brief pastorates before arriving in Spokane. He followed in Watson's tradition. He was known as a very strong teacher and preacher. He also had a particular interest in keeping the ministry to the native population and to the growing African-American population in this area alive and well. And I say this because by this time in the history of Spokane, there had come to be at least a broad attitude of, I think, a little bit of embarrassment about what had happened to the natives, and that was mixed with almost making them something like invisible people. We've talked about that before. It's not a happy chapter. I don't think in our own history, but this man stood in some sharp contrast to that attitude as he wanted to keep invigorated the ministry of First Presbyterian, especially in that direction. Interestingly, one of the first duties that fell to him upon arriving in his new pastorate was to preside at the memorial service of Chief Spokane Gary. I don't know if he ever had an opportunity to meet the man. I think he probably might have, but Gary died early in January of 1892. I also don't know how familiar Mundy was with the history of uh, Sp uh, Chief Spokane Gary, but he must have had at least some familiarity with it. As I say, all of Gary's family by this time had become Presbyterian, and that's part, part of what leads me to say that just after his death, I think Gary did too. But in any event, uh, here at his memorial service, this was a, a great uh, opportunity for First Presbyterian to have an opportunity to be involved in that recognition. Besides that, uh, Monday had a challenging ministry. There was a nationwide what was called financial panic that was going on that occasionally would take place. But at the same time, he was dealing with the politics of this disaffected church that now wanted readmission. This was the Westminster Presbyterian Church, who now came early in the ministry of Frank Mundy. I think they were waiting for Watson to leave, or at least uh, uh, for that not to be an issue anymore. And they came back and they wanted to come back into the church. And Mundy said to them, consistent with the Book of Order, you can, you can individually join the church, any of you, but there's no provision in the Book of Order for a merger. 
to take two churches and actually try to marry them in the way that you're envisioning here, which would make Westminster kind of a separate, distinct subgroup within First Presbyterian. And so that was not acceptable to these folks, and they actually wound up merging not with First Presbyterian, but with First Congregational in Spokane, which gave rise to the church known as Westminster Congregational Church, which is still with us, of course, to this day down at the corner of Third and Bernard. Mundy himself resigned only after a couple of years. In 1894, he moved to Atlantic City, and this brought now the uh, William Gibbony that I mentioned earlier. Young man showed up here in 1894 and became the uh, next pastor. He was of Scot-Irish Covenanter stock. If you've been in this class for some time, you know the Covenanters of Scotland we've talked about in some detail on other occasions. He has the distinction of being the second longest tenured pastor here at First Presbyterian. He was here, as you can see, from 1894 to 1908. Uh, does anybody happen to know, by the way, who has the longest tenure? Does anyone know enough trivia of First Press history? A fellow by the name of Paul Calhoun was here for 18 years. He came in 1836, and for 18 years subsequent, he was the pastor through some very, very difficult times. That was the Second World War, as you know. And so he was a good pastor and was here for some time. This is the second longest tenure, uh, uh, William Gebony. He was committed to character. In fact, if I could just make this comment, you know that the motto of First Presbyterian Church today is uh, inwardly strong, outwardly focused, right? You've, you've all seen that little phrase. And I think this guy captures that. If you look at the sermons he preached, you see that he has both objectives in mind. Uh, with respect to character, these are typical of the kinds of things he would say. He'd say, uh, this is from a sermon, quote, another need is the deepening and the strengthening of the spiritual life. The formation of Christian character is the greatest work committed to man, for it is the character that makes the man. <clears throat> the laying of foundations in prayer, Bible study, and the public duties in God's house are the divinely ordained means of growth and grace. Let these things be emphasized. But he was not simply a devotional preacher. It wasn't simply a matter of developing the inward life. He was very aware of what was happening in the community and was not the least bit shy about addressing himself to public concerns, something that's probably much less frequently done these days in any church. Uh, but uh, in any event, this is a little more typical of some of his uh, critical and prophetic statements. He said, uh, these are kind of typical, quote, the church has a special duty and a special responsibility for the common everyday laborer. Christ himself looks in loving sympathy to all such and is anxious to help them uh, make their burdens lighter by his presence and power. He said on one occasion, quote, finally, I wish to say that the union of religion and business is the solution of all our troubles, both personal and uh, national. It, it sounds a little over the top, but in the context of the sermon, he was talking about abusive business practices and the way in which it was injuring some people. And uh, so he was, in a sense, in that context, saying that business people need to be more Christian. They need to incorporate Christian ethical principles in their business conduct. So that was the general context. He says, quote, all social problems will find their settlement when there shall be a universal recognition of divine precepts in everyday life. The difference between employer and employed will cease when religion has its true hold upon the human hearts. The press actually noticed this guy, and in an article written in December of 1901, the Spokesman Review uh, gave this comment, uh, quoting him now, quote, are the people to continue to suffer on account of the inactivity and inefficiency of their representatives, close quote, is the question propounded by the Reverend G. William Gibbony, Doctor of Divinity of the First Presbyterian Church. This utterance was made in a prelude to his sermon on the public concerns preached to his congregation last evening. In that sermon, he said this, quote, it is a shame to allow a few saloon keepers, gamblers, and hobos to dictate to our city government. It's a shame to allow the dollar to have greater weight with us than the safety of our boys and girls. 
A very general opinion prevails among Christian and moral people that we have laws sufficient to suppress the wine room evil if the mayor and the chief of police would only act in the manner. Uh, why should we be compelled to ask our public officials to do their duty? So, you know, there was a little bit of spice in this guy. He had a heavy emphasis on uh, church discipline, but probably the thing for which he's most affectionately remembered by us at First Press is that uh, he was the one who began to gin up the original vision of what at the time was called the temple. Uh, we haven't called it that since, but at the time that was kind of the catch term for the final building that would be erected for a permanent home for Pres First Presbyterian Church. The what of the matter was clear. We needed a larger facility. The where was somewhat up for grabs. And there was quite a bit of controversy, quite a bit of dissent here and there about just exactly where such a building should be built. As it turns out, A.M. Cannon, I mentioned earlier, was a trustee at First Presbyterian, owned a mansion. And this is the Cannon Mansion that was in the middle of the block at 4th and Cedar. It uh, had been removed only the prior year, but it had in its history in Spokane from the 1880s and on been a center of social life and so on, quite a remarkable edifice. But it was removed in 1907, and that became the site that was, a that was finally landed on. The pastor who actually was here when the building was uh, erected was uh, uh, Willis McFadden. He was our pastor from 1909 to 1915. He was from Athens, Ohio. He actually was a businessman before he became a pastor. He had training at Western uh, Theological Seminary. He served three churches before arriving here in Spokane in 1909. And it was he that laid the cornerstone for the temple uh, on June 16, 1909. The building that was uh, constructed looks like this. It was finished on June 12, 1910. McFadden uh, uh, prayed a prayer. There was, a, a, in fact, the pastor I mentioned last week who was uh, pastoring over this uh, astronomically rapidly growing church in Seattle came and preached the dedicatory sermon here at First Press, but the dedicatory prayer was given by McFadden in which he said in part, quote, defend the people who shall worship in this church from the sins of false doctrine and the spirit of strife. Let not the foot of pride come nigh to hurt them and make it ever conscious that they, as well as the work of their hands, are God's workmanship. He continued, may this pulpit and people ever be a source of light in the darkness a fountain of life in the wilderness, a saving station in the city. The following December, Handel's Messiah was sung for the first time, 1910, here at First Presbyterian Church. We haven't done the Messiah every year since, but probably about half the years since the Messiah has been done, as it will be done this afternoon at four o'clock right here as you know at First Presbyterian. It was also leaders of First Presbyterian Church who immediately began to go to work to induce Whitworth College, which as you know was at Tacoma in the time. We talked about that last week. And Whitworth moved to this town largely out of the influence of uh, leaders at First Presbyterian in 1914. This photograph, uh, many of you who are familiar with the campus know that's Macmillan on the right and Bal Ballard on the uh, left. Uh, the two original buildings of Whitworth uh, College at that time. Uh, this particular uh, drawing of uh, First Presbyterian Church was uh, done by my good friend John Plimley, who is now with the Lord. He did this drawing in 1980. 1980 happens to be the year that I also joined Presbyterian, uh, First Presbyterian Church. And uh, John, I want to say, and a little bit of a side tribute to him, was one of the most faithful participants in this class. I came to First Presbyterian at a, uh, at a dark time in my life. Uh, Candy joined later. We married in this church in 1983, but in 1980 I was here more or less on my own. And, uh, and there was a, a wonderful way in which the prayer, I think, that McFadden had prayed was uh, realized. I read these words and I sort of took them to heart almost immediately. 
May this pulpit and people ever be a source of light in the darkness. I will tell you, I felt a little darkness as I came through the doors in October of 1980, uh, and McFadden's prayer was answered for me. Uh, a fountain of life in the wilderness, that wilderness that I was experiencing, uh, was met by a fountain of life and a pastor whose name was Dick Leon, and he was just a wonderful and deeply uh, pastoral character in my own life at that time, a saving station in the city. And so whatever it's meant to you, I just want to go on record at this point that McFadden's prayer was answered at least in the case of this humble character. And I know that for uh, all of us in this room, we have seen God working in remarkable ways to accomplish his purposes down through the history of this church. I started teaching in the adult education program uh, when I was much too soon, you know. Uh, uh, Earlene Cochran, bless her heart, came up when I was still kind of bleeding and said, uh, hey, how would you like to teach adult Sunday school? And uh, you know, I was too dumb to say no and I've been doing it ever since. So now for about 30 straight years, I've been at it and for a uh, thank you. <clears throat> And for 30 straight years, uh, God has been answering McFadden's prayer. So I'm grateful for that and want to express, as I know many of you would, confidence of this, that the one who began a good work among you, among us, will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ.